Yo, what's up everybody, Professor V here, and this is the intro to Psych Reviews, let's go! My intentions with this series is to broadly cover topics often covered in an intro to psychology or general psychology course. The link to the textbook I use for the classes I teach is in the description below if you'd like to follow along. For the first video of the series, I will touch on some of the basics of two major research methods used in psychology, descriptive research and correlational research. The first methodology is descriptive research. This methodology is used to observe, collect, and record data. This is all done without the experimenters from interfering with the outcomes. No manipulation of the variables. In naturalistic observations, the experimenter observes a situation from a distance and records what happens. The biggest advantage of naturalistic observations is so that experimenters can obtain data on natural behavior in a natural environment environment rather than an artificial environment in which a participant knows that they're being watched and which people and animals may act differently. It allows the collection of real world experiences and data on those experiences. However, the lack of control and the inability to determine causation is a downfall to this technique. Surveys and interviews are more hands-on than naturalistic observations. However, they still do not determine causation. They are often used as a self-report on behaviors, opinions, attitudes, and thought patterns. Advantages to surveys include the ability to collect a large amount of data as they can be distributed face-to-face -face or electronically and reach many people in a short period of time. However, there are negative aspects of surveys and one of the biggest ones is that not everyone is always honest. The more intrusive or personal a question is, the higher the chances of lying. For example, if someone were to have eight sexual partners in one month span, and then the interviewer asks, how many sexual partners have you had in the past month? The interviewee will most likely give a lower number than eight, perhaps zero or one, as having eight sexual partners is deemed socially unacceptable and can be embarrassing. Case studies are often used when there are rare cases and it would be difficult to find enough participants to be part of a study. So instead, researchers find one individual with the condition they are researching and study them intensively. For example, one of the most famous cases is Phineas Gage, who was a railroad worker in the 1840s. In 1848, he suffered a horrific accident. A blast caused an iron rod to go up through his jaw and exit through the top of his skull. And luckily, he survived. Prior to the accident though, family members, friends, and co-workers described him as hardworking, responsible, and intelligent. However, afterwards, the opposite were true of Gage. His case largely contributed to neuroscience and what the frontal lobe of the brain controls. Now, it would be unethical to ask participants to have an iron rod pierce their skull and brain, and thus the only way to study the effects of brain damage is by doing case studies from those who already have brain damage, with permission, of course. Lastly, for descriptive research is archival research. This is when researchers look at historical records, hence the word archival, to measure behaviors or events that occurred in the past. For example, a group of researchers found that people tend to marry individuals whose first names or last names resemble their own. The data was collected using official websites containing birth records, marriage records, and joint telephone listings. Correlational research examines the relationship between two different variables. While descriptive research may answer who, what, when, and where, correlational research can answer whether and how two or more variables change together. These relationships or correlations can be found to be either positive, negative, or non-existent. Positive correlations are when one variable increases, so does the other. Or if one variable decreases, so does the other. For example, as children get older, their height increases. Age increases as height increases. A negative correlation is when one variable increases and another variable decreases or vice versa. For example, the final grade in a class decreases as the number of absences increase. 
non-existent correlations happen when one variable does not have a relationship with another variable at all. For example, your intelligence has no relationship with how many games the New England Patriots football team win in a season. Though, in my opinion, being a fan of the New England Patriots causes lower intelligence. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Those were jokes. Just some friendly sport trash talk. The direction and the strength of a correlation is stated using the correlation coefficient, which ranges from positive one to negative one. The symbol denotes the direction of the relationship, if it is a positive correlation or negative correlation. The number represents the strength of the relationship. The closer to one the correlation coefficient is, the stronger the correlation between the two variables. A perfect correlation, whether the direction is positive or negative, is one. So if you have the question on an exam asking which of the following shows the strongest correlation and these are your answer choices, don't be fooled by the signs. The number that is closest to one is the strongest despite it being a negative number. The answer is C. There are limits to correlations. First, they do not show any causation. You cannot determine if one variable causes any changes in another because there may be other unknown factors or known factors. For instance, stress is positively correlated to heart disease. However, it is impossible to say that it was stress alone that caused the heart disease to develop. Perhaps there was a genetic predisposition, maybe poor diet, maybe lack of exercise. A third variable may be responsible for the connection of the two initial variables. There are other factors involved, which is called the third variable problem. There isn't any ethical way to determine if stress causes heart disease. In order to show causation, you would need to design a study that forces a person to experience stress until they showed signs of heart disease. Would you volunteer for that? I didn't think so. Sometimes some correlations are an illusion. They don't exist, and the relationship is a result of just coincidence. And this concludes this episode on descriptive and correlational research studies in psychology. There is a third major research methodology used in psychology, experimental research, which warrants its own video and which I will discuss in a future episode. Thank you for watching. Hit that like button if you found this helpful. Subscribe if not already, and I'll see you in the next one.